there's all this literature on like help seeking behaviors, right? And they'll say like black and brown folks have poor help seeking behaviors. They don't like to go to counseling. Even if we make more counseling more readily available, folks don't go to it. Without understanding that like the structures in which counseling are offered are problematic, right? Like you can go to counseling, but if it doesn't feel real, you're not going to go back. And why would you go when there are other places that feel more cathartic? When we start to pay attention to what's happening in the community, it can open up pathways for us. Hi, everyone. This is Ava Bravada Keating, and welcome to Psychologies of Liberation, a podcast that examines the goals and practices of psychology with radical imagination to help us all get free. This podcast is for all of us world builders who are not only interested in grappling with systems, structures, and ideologies that threaten our well-being, but who dream into new futures for relationship that are grounded in joy, equity, and everyone's right to beautiful, radiant things. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Ian Levy, counselor educator, rapper, and associate professor of school counseling at Manhattan College in the Bronx. We discuss engaging kids on their own terms using hip hop, expanding conceptions of what school counseling can look like, the importance of bringing forth a unique and genuine offering as a mental health professional, and more. Here's the amazing Dr. Levy. My name is Dr. Ian Levy. I'm an associate professor of school counseling at Manhattan College uh, in the Bronx, New York. I'm soon to be the chair of the counseling and therapy department, which is really cool and excited about that. Um, I'm from New York and live here. My family is also here. So I'm a, I'm a father and a husband in addition to being a professor. And, uh, um, and I'm also a musician. I'm a rapper. And so I'm sort of all of these things and they're all kind of integral to my work. So I specialize in hip hop based approaches to counseling and schools. But a lot of that is tied to who I am and 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 where I come from. Yeah, I mean, would you speak a little bit more, Dr. Levy, about your work, um, particularly the ways in which you've um, brought like hip hop in as a sort of primary tool to, for school counseling? Yeah. yeah, well, so first I'll say, you know, like on on a personal level, hip hop has been extremely helpful for me in terms of sorting through a lot of my lived experiences and sharing them uh, with people, right? And so I was sort of drawn to hip hop because it was a place where I could, again, like share these untold stories and then find like tons of support and validation from people when I did that. Like my vulnerabilities were celebrated in ways that they had not been prior. The things that I was scared to talk about all of a sudden were the things that I was like celebrated for talking about. So it's like it was a complete shift in how I saw myself. And it's not I'm not by any means the only person that that hip hop has done this for. That's what it does, right? Like hip hop is this Uh, mechanism to support people in telling their stories, particularly counter narratives. Um, And so I come to work from like just a love for rapping and for hip hop spaces and sharing stories. And so when I first entered the field, there was this like big ask of practitioners to develop more innovative approaches, to bring innovative approaches that respond to the nuanced ways that like effectively non-white populations engage with the world. And what was funny was I, as I was doing my master's work, it became very apparent that everything that was necessary within a counseling space was like kind of organically happening, like in these open mic spaces downtown or like in the park and ciphers that I've been in. And so it seemed funny that, you know, we were asking for these things, but yet they were happening right outside and and in in many ways like outside of the institution and so my first like attempt then at at trying to bridge that that divide i suppose between like formalized institution and like what was happening at the community level within hip-hop spaces was to just like bring my microphone from my closet in my apartment to my office as a school counselor and invite youth to like share music they liked with me and then 
if they wanted to find instrumental versions of those same songs and try to write some of their own lyrics and record them during session, we could do that. So it started out in this very sort of like simple kind of a way. And, and in a way that I, I didn't even fully understand the various ways that, that hip hop culture can exist or, or, or should exist if youth are really to utilize it for their own growth, right? I was looking at it through this very uh, narrow lens of like, let's write some songs, let's listen to some songs. Um, and certainly that was cool, but by doing that, it, it opened up a world. Youth asked me to get better equipment to actually make it feel like a legitimate studio, which then led to us going online and starting like crowdsourced initiatives where they would load up different things they wanted for the studio space and their family members gravitated towards it because of their own gifts and, and talents and offered workshops or donated equipment and like everybody started sort of forming around it and it turned into this way larger kind of like school-wide approach but again because that's what youth wanted it to be right and so that's a little bit about my work i can go in forever about it but that's sort of a um, a bit about my work and how I got into it. Mm -hmm. I think it's so um, important what you're talking about, about seeing that this stuff is already happening in communities, yeah. right? And we really need as mental health practitioners, um, as people who are doing the work in institutions, we really need to take point from what's already happening outside. Yes. I've conceptualized it in, in my mind, I suppose, um, as like there's these community defined practices, right? There are things that communities have historically done to offer to themselves cathartic outlets as well as just like therapeutic tools or strategies. And they've oftentimes happened in response to the lack of adequate services. There's this perception, I think, oftentimes, and you'll see this, and unfortunately, in the literature, there's all this literature on like help seeking behaviors, right? And they'll say like black and brown folks have poor help help seeking behaviors. They don't like to go to counseling, even if we make more counseling more readily available, folks don't go to it without understanding that like the structures in which counseling are offered are problematic, right? Like you can go to counseling, but if it doesn't feel real, you're not going to go back. And why would you go when there are other places that feel more cathartic and and more inviting? And so when we start to again, pay attention to what's happening in the community, it can open up pathways for us to really innovate our own practices. That, But that's a delicate balance, right? Because the academy will always grab onto something. Like, it's funny to be talking about hip hop now, right? This is the 50th anniversary of hip hop, right? So it's like, we can talk about hip hop and, and how cool it is and how we should use it. But like, this thing's been around for 50 years. And before that, if you really consider like the roots of hip hop and where it comes from and everything like that. And so we're always behind and catching up. And then, and then in our catching up, the Academy usually tries to like claim something as their own, which is like mm -hmm. colonization 101, right? Like um, yeah. denounce something and then claim it as your own. Right. And so I think that there's this tension that we have to pay attention to when it's like, yeah, things are happening at the community level. They've always been happening at the community level. We should think about how to use them in our work, but we shouldn't try to like take them. The, the danger is when, when by placing them in our work, we actually take them away from the community and, and water them down. And that I think is a piece that I've always been aware of. And I think that that's why we need to let like, youth at, or for me it's always been youth but whomever we're working with right kind of lead what this looks like right so like this idea of like just put a mic in your office and engage in dialogue and see what different assets lie within the community that you're in that can help build a unique program is letting community opening the door for community to guide what this looks and feels like and i think that for me is is an active way of saying like i'm not gonna like create like really strong curriculum for this or like sell manuals and, and all the things that the academy does because i find that that will water down the essence of the thing right yeah i think that that makes 
so much sense. And I mean, I wonder when you were sort of establishing this program with other colleagues, did you find that you, there were ways in which you had to be protective of or sort of firm in foregrounding like youth leadership in this pilot program? Um, yeah. Because of exactly what you're talking about, the sort of natural uh, pull of the academy to appropriate or to minimize or to, to sort of yeah. shift shift the practice. Yeah, I think, you know, in my practical work, a lot of my work has been done in, you know, the ninth grade level, or I used to specialize in the ninth grade level. I love ninth graders. It's like my favorite time period because they're like awkwardly moving out of being in eighth grade in middle school and high school. It's just a funny time for kids. And so I love it, right? Uh, it's a great time to get in, into the work. And what was interesting was I rem I have this memory of, um, it's a story. So I was engaging in a lot of my studio work and principals will say this to me all the time. Somebody said this to me last week, an assistant principal at a school in the Bronx said, you know, your work, it, it brings in like a different type of kid, right? Classic. It was just yeah. like the kid that the kid that everybody labels as like the problem kid, the kid that the deficit language is used for, right? The kids that are labeled for being like overly aggressive or like, and just completely from a lack of understanding, like the structures, the, the school system's inability to like understand and see and appraise like the brilliance in young people in any event it manifests in these ways. And so like my work has always engaged the kids that school systems have not engaged. That's like been a, a thread. And I think that makes sense, right? Because people <laughs> that engage with hip hop are usually outside of institution, right? So like that was an important piece because when I first started doing my work, uh, there I remember that there were some teachers also at the ninth grade level that were struggling to engage those same kids. So they'd be in the studio space, we'd be doing our work, it'd be really powerful. Then they would leave and they'd go to like a math class or an English class. And it would not go well, right, um, in that class. And I remember the principal sitting me down and saying, there's concern from other some other teachers that you're just like having fun with kids and making music and not setting the culture that we need to be setting at the ninth grade level, which is super, I mean, just racist, but also just um, there was this ask that as the ninth grade person, I was there to like build culture and suggesting that hip hop in some capacity was going to undermine culture, even though it is culture, right? And, like it's, and it's not professional enough or official enough or therapeutic enough or something. Exactly. And doesn't allow youth to present themselves in ways that are deemed to be successful within school and schooling. And mm -hmm. that tension was wild because I'm there to do to engage in counseling and there's this like appreciation of hip hop from oftentimes from administrators when kids can write a rap about like some academic content, but not when they can like just tell their own stories in their own ways, right? Mm -hmm. And that's in, always been interesting because it's then again, like the utilization of this really important and powerful tool to just further assimilate youth into the ways that we engage in schooling or it's the way that it can counter that right and it's like depending on the administrator it is utilized differently now i've worked with amazing administrators who haven't cared and they've like celebrated whatever youth create and so there's that piece and there's also administrators that that try to utilize it you know when kids start cutting school or not coming you know their, their attendance slacks or they're not doing well in class then there's always like well now they can't go to the studio anymore which is always interesting because when would you ever take counseling or therapy away from a young person who's struggling but like again it's used as this like carrot to perform well when in reality it shouldn't necessarily be that right this is this is a a, a helping tool uh, within within the school environment. And so it's always been this. And, you know, I think there's, for what it's worth, is I always feel like I have to add this when, when I'm talking around these ideas, like there's certainly room to engage in discussion with youth about 
the lyrics that they write and the content that they say and the, the unlearning of various isms that might manifest in lyrics because they're representative of the larger society that we live in. So yes, like we have to talk about like misogyny, homophobia, transphobia within lyrics, like with youth. And yes, 100%. But we can't do that unless we allow the lyrics to happen first, right? Because <laughs> you need you need the lyrics to exist, so then we can sit down and talk through them. So it's it always been interesting to me when there's like a complete like let's unplug everything and not allow youth to express in this way, uh, because that's never going to actually allow us to work through the difficult things that we need to work through, right? We need those to 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 come to light, right? There's that Jay Z, my my favorite Jay Z quote says, "You can't heal what you never reveal," right? And so it's like. We have to be able to talk about these things and um, we can't if the administrators in the building are trying to control how youth come and express themselves and share their stories. And I'd rather sit in, in the mess and work through it than ignore it, right? Those are a lot of the tensions that I've felt around the work in schools and, and the, the way that people try to kind of control what it looks or sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I see a very much like a carceral logic in what you're so you're saying yeah. there right mm -hmm. like self-policing of what you're able to express and we would never say you know in behind a closed door in a more sort of like stereotypical therapeutic encounter right like that there's some things that the client can say and some things that the client can't say you know yeah we would never put those those sorts of parameters on this so why do nope. that in this school counseling context particularly working with kids that are typically left out of the fold. And obviously there's a lot of like thinly coded racialized uh, stuff going on. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's really, uh, it's really something to see. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And I, and I think just at a broader level, what's been interesting about engaging in the work of school counseling is the way that counseling um, interacts with education. And that's not to say that there's not structural impacts on people, regardless of what setting that they're in. But education is a very, very nuanced, complex system that has forever been used as a tool for erasure of identities and, you know, assimilative practices. And so, like, how do you then in counseling? It's funny where right? we're asked to support people in self-actualizing within a system that could be argued is... <laughs> creating like dissonance right in identity and so it's like it's always been an interesting phenomena um i'm here to help people grow but only in a way that is appropriate within this environment as defined by whomever how do you how do you do that right can you even do that and then if i'm in control of telling you how they can present themselves or how they should walk into a classroom and address a teacher in a way that makes the teacher feel comfortable, so on and so forth, to deal with culture or to set the culture. Am I counseling? Or now am I actually like the antithesis of what I'm supposed to be? So these are all the tensions, right? And I think that's why I'm very into um, interrogating school counselors' identity. It's another sort of piece of my work around this, like always both educator and counselor. And how do you like live in the in between of those worlds and do work that supports people in authentically developing, uh, holistically developing? And um, yeah, anyways, don't have answers for all that yet, but but um, nor will I ever. But the the but it's certainly like something I've been thinking a lot about is just how the work changes when you're in an educational context. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, absolutely. And could you speak a little bit more about the interrogating school counselors identity piece that you just mentioned? Yeah. So school counselors, right? Um, the term that we've been using a lot, my colleague, Matthew Lemberger, True Love, and I have been writing about uh, what we call like the educator counselor um, hyphen. What we, it's sort of going to sound a little clunky, but we, we refer to it as like a non-hierarchical, non-dual identity. So it just is always both, right? It's not like a lot of people talk about like, I'm a school counselor. I'm asked to go into an English classroom and deliver a social skills lesson. They're, they'll say things like school counselors wear many hats. So now I'm 
going in there and I'm putting on my teacher hat. Um, I don't believe that that's possible, right? Like I, I don't like, I don't believe that I can just like silo out one version of my identity in this space and be teacher. I'm even the way that I engage in a classroom setting is through counseling, right? It's towards development. And so like, whether it's my active listening skills or my micro skills that are at play, my dialogical skills, my group, like attention to group dynamics, right, um, are at play. But also the understanding that like the school counselor's role within an educational system is, in my opinion, not as much about intervention as it is about prevention and development. And so I'm very big on, in my work, preventative strategies. I love thinking about how like the school counselor's awareness to find ways to build a studio within the school environment, listen to students to learn about people in their lives that might help us construct a program, might offer DJing lessons, might have like be able to do a dope graffiti mural in the school building. All of those things don't look like counseling or sound like counseling, particularly in like the medical model world of what this is supposed to look like, but they are that, right? That like if I if I have a dope mural on the school that kids created and an amazing studio naturally the school becomes more inviting of other identities. So now if I'm a student who's never been to the school before and I'm starting as a ninth grader and I walk into the school building, I already feel like I can present myself differently, which means that that's a counseling service that's being delivered to that individual, even if they don't even know that they're getting it because it's this preventative service, right? It, and I think a lot about that work in terms of the liberatory work, right? It's all the structural work the shifts that we are able to make within contexts that serve development, that serve wellness, um, that address like social inequities that prevent identity from manifesting in, in authentic ways. And I think that's why it's like, it's cool, yeah, to talk about like hip hop work inside the office in a small group. And I think that that's a piece of the work, but that's not all of the work, right? Like. Yes, a certain subset of youth might really benefit from a group, but some might just benefit from like knowing that there's a studio there that they can pop in after school when they need to real quick and then carry on. Or like they can help design a mural one day or they can just like chill and eat lunch and look at the mural. And like like there's there's a range of ways that this that services are offered. And I and I think about the school counselor that way. And I and I think about how counseling needs to be seen as this more developmental preventative thing and not just I'm sitting down engaging in counseling in the way that we imagine it is supposed to look or, or sound like. Mm -hmm. Right, which is very much in the sort of white Eurocentric model of like two people behind a closed door. And I, I really appreciate what you're talking about you're being expansive, right, in thinking about what it can actually mean to do therapeutic work, right? And it is about, like, establishing a culture where people feel like they can be their authentic selves. It is about, like, folks knowing that they have resources available to them that they can use should and if they, they need it, right? It's knowing mm -hmm. that they don't have to code switch or change who they are, um, right, like, when they're going to seek that service, right? Or, right. to, you know, even even saying seek the service is like a little bit um, caught up in the in the um, yeah. in the, you know, like our language uh, yeah. can't actually hold this expansive idea very well. No, um, no, it's yeah. not built for it. Right. Should folks even need to <laughs> ask for services? Should they need to look for services? Should they yeah. just be there? Right. And I think that's it. Be because we live in a world where counseling is wedded to deficit, to individual deficit, we're waiting for a person to showcase a symptom and then we utilize a therapeutic intervention, right? Rather than everyone needs counseling, our world is a mess right now. Like it's like, and it's always been, right? But like, for, like things are popping off all the time. If you're not waking up frustrated with something, that's, a problem, right? Like that we we need to be responding to everyone and creating services that are 
available for everyone at different gradients across this like wellness spectrum because everybody needs counseling. But counseling does not have to look like this traditional idea of counseling. And it, for me, it's like development. It, what's funny about this is like, not to get too in the weeds here, but like the American Counseling Association, right? ACA. They used to be ACDA. So they used to be the American Counseling and Development Association. In the 80s, they dropped the word development. And it's also where we started moving more towards the medical model. So we started like, again, like everything, it's all billable hours. It's all the, you know, it, it's like we're more wedded to the pharmaceutical industry, everything, right? We lost development, mm -hmm. which is wild because that's the entire, for me, it's most of the work, right? Like, and I just, it's, it stinks that we wait we just wait, right? We wait for the for a, a moment to respond. And that's it. And that's the way that we see mental health. Even right now, as mental health has like become this thing that everybody wants to talk about all the time everywhere, it's still talked about in this very like uh granular way where it's not it's not expensive at all. There's this commercial with like Kristen Bell and she's like, I need to deal with my mental health and like pops a pill and that's the commercial, right? And it's like, that can't be the only way, right? Like that can't be the only thing or the only way, but that's how it's framed. Um, and that's what's coming through our televisions, right? That like, with no like acknowledgement of like, this is an incredibly affluent white woman who can just purchase a pill, like, right? Like with nothing, it's just like, but that's how... That's how um, we're going to conceptualize this thing and then and then distribute it to the public. And so mental health, right, and, and wellness for me and, and this idea of educator counselor, it all comes back to development and prevention and making sure that everybody has access to counseling in a multitude of ways that respond to where they are on their own journeys. And that's what this needs to look like. And so is there probably a place for like pharmaceuticals and for medical model? Like for, yeah, of course. Like, I'm not saying like, let's do away with, you know, traditional counseling services or like one-on-one -on -one therapy or group work, you know, or anything like that. I'm just saying that like, that shouldn't be the only place that we usher everybody towards. Right. And in fact, we can like lower the, there's weight, you know, there's long wait lists at like every clinic everywhere right now we can help minimize those wait lists by engaging in more preventative services, right? I would love to live in a world where people don't feel like they need to go to see a therapist. And that's not because I want to undermine therapy, but I want people to be well, right? And so like, but if I don't want people to be well, then I will just make money off of the fact that they need treatment in this other way, right? And I think we, again, like I, I I want services available to everybody um, in different ways, if that if that's not clear <laughs> in my rambling here. Yeah. Oh, it's it's crystal clear. Yeah. And um, I think that you're just talking about building a culture, building a world that um, that is therapeutic, that doesn't like cut people off from their authenticity, that doesn't demand that it's professionalized or cause us to segment ourselves off from important mm -hmm. parts of us. Like, I love what you're talking about, this sort of inextricably linked, like um, uh, non-reducible identity of counselor mm -hmm. educator. Like it isn't one or the other, you know, maybe you sort of call upon different skills in your toolkit, you know, um, when you're in different spaces and you calibrate, of course, but like, you know, it's Dr. Levy, educator, counselor, right? Not yeah. one or the other at different sort of um, different times. And, yeah. you know, I think that a lot too, like in the way that we educate people to be therapists or educate yes. people to be mental health workers, because I think there's so much of an emphasis on like, okay, well, um, or maybe there's lip service paid to like the importance of being sort of an integrated full being, right? Mm -hmm. But um, when we're actually talking about like how to implement that, it's very easy for that idea to fall off or to become sort of like actively pushed away. Yeah. And it's again, because we see schools as like, not really spaces where they'll use the word clinical, like, well, are you really clinical? But clinical is just word for traditional 
counseling yeah. in the office, right? It's not developmental, it's not preventative, right? And I'm just like, we need it all, right? We need it all. We every every helping professional has a very very important role, and the only way that we succeed in helping people uh, is by all working together and understanding where our roles are, right? And like, so yeah, I want an array of services. I want my preventative services. Yeah, I want various levels of of intervention that need to occur from different professionals. I want evaluative services where needed. But then of course, all of those need to be <laughs> culturally responsive as well. And like, you know, back to sort of the hip hop piece is like, well, then how, you know, how do you do hip hop work across all of these different types of services, right? Across the educator counselor spectrum of services. And I, and I, yeah, that's kind of a lot of what I've been thinking about more recently in, in my work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that I have been thinking a lot about too, as I'm mm. chewing on these ideas and talking to brilliant people like you about the work is um, how this kind of liberatory or decolonized or expansive view of um, sitting with people, right? Um, being with people, uh, facilitating authenticity, all of this, right? I've been wondering if it implies or is sort of undergirded by a fundamental love of humanity. And so I wonder if you could just sort of like muse on that topic for a little bit. Like, do you think that to be a good counselor educator implies implies that? And if so, like, how does that inform or show up in your work? I think at the core of my work, like if I were to boil down like the things that I stand on as a counseling professional, it's probably like the core humanistic foundations, principles, unconditional positive regard, right? Is what's coming to my mind as you're talking, as well as empathy, as well as congruence or authenticity. And I think to really deeply practice unconditional positive regard is to actively try to develop in my mind like a a love right a love for humans for the folks that we're working with in so much as that love then allows us to like work through anything that gets in the way of that, right? Like any biases that come up, any frustrations that come up, um, which definitely come up, right? Like <laughs> our clients are going to say things that rub us the wrong way or do things that make us feel a certain way. And and how do you, how do you still hold on to that like fundamental love? And I think what's interesting about that, you know, is the way that we like frame, I feel like there are a lot of terms within the work that have actually gotten in the way of unconditional positive regard you know we'll talk a lot about like self-disclosure in conversations around like boundaries and certainly i'm a believer in boundaries but it's very binary right there's no room for actual conversations about how we stretch the definitions of boundaries still within a professional way but to to form connections when we need to in different ways and, and i think like in schools, for example, it's so different. There's all this stuff that we learn of like, you know, if you have a private practice, have one door that people come through and one door that people leave through so they never see each other in the waiting room. Like, how the heck does that happen in schools? I run a session and I see the kid in the hallway later, right? Like, so everything right. is different. Kids are going to ask me why I'm not following them on Instagram. And I'm gonna be like, well, because I can't. But also like, but so these kinds of conversations are like boundaries are always pushed and pulled. And like, if these are important to me because like if i'm not able to connect with youth in ways that they feel i need to connect with them then how can i actually form the relationships i need that cultivate these things like unconditional positive regard like empathy like congruence like if i can't even connect with folks in certain ways i'm not suggesting that we all friend all of our clients on instagram right but what i am suggesting is like a real like thoughtful discussion with colleagues with ourselves with our folks within spaces that we work in about what are the ways that we 
can better connect with the folks we're working with, to see them in more authentic ways, to work through our own like biases about what we might hold about about them. Um, because I think that like these stark ways that we engage in boundaries and, and things like self-disclosure, which in my mind are just connected, right, are are getting in the way, right? I've worked in schools where like everybody has to be called like, you know, in this case, like Mr. Levy or something like this. And like, you can't use first names. It's like, no, you can't. If you, And if students use a first name on, for a teacher, it's disrespectful. And I think like these blanket things without discussion, like I so appreciated you opening up the dialogue today. Like, how would you like to be called, right? Like without discussion about that, then it's just, again, like creating power dynamics that get in the way of us being able to form authentic connections. These humanistic principles are threatened. I think it's, it's, um, yeah, about understanding the, the natural barriers that are created in, in the lack of understanding of the different mental health professionals, but also how our work interfaces with the systems we work in and how those structures get in the way of like authentic connections. Right. I mean, I think what you're calling for is a dynamic sort of engagement with yeah. with how we're supposed to do this work, like what it means, like how we flex in different scenarios and situations, right? Like the school context is different than like if someone is seeing one-on-one -on -one clients, right? Like yeah. um, it changes based upon like the kinds of clients you're seeing, kids, adults, people with different needs. Mm -hmm. And to calcify I think oftentimes is based in fear, right? It's like an anxiety yeah. response of like, okay, yeah. well, we don't want to do something bad when yeah. in fact resting on those laurels can do harm in the lack of critical engagement. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It will just disengage, right? Like, and that might not even be the worst thing that it does, right? But like, what, it, it, it's not, it's, it's actually going to, yeah, hinder connection. Our fear will always hinder connection. And love, I mean, love is a really interesting, like, thing to think about within the context of counseling. Because, like, if I'm supposed to be this blank slate therapist, you know, what do I do when clients use the word love or when kids use the word love? Like, <clears throat> within hip-hop, there's, um, like, the term oftentimes, like, J so Jay-Z had this song, Jay-Z and old, old Kanye had this song um called big brother and but big brother being this like term of endearment right and big and big bro little bro and so like i've had students of mine refer to me as big bro and like i know that it is important to reciprocate with like like i got you little bro not and and like but can't if i say that around a supervisor who doesn't understand that what happens right and i think that these like these are the things that i'm talking about when i'm trying to reference like boundaries and our perceptions of like if a young person says to me like i love you big bro am i allowed to say back like i love you little bro like i would argue yeah <laughs> like what harm I, does yeah. that do right what actual harm does that do in this moment to do that right like but there's going to be like you can't say that like you you know and so it's it might like, do harm I, to not say that actually you know yes exactly it might do harm to not say that it might disengage and there's still lines you know you say i love you little bro you know and then later you know the kids are kids will be kids they'll be like Hey, leave you when I graduate. Can we smoke up together? And be like, nope. You know, so like you still have to be able to like be funny with them, like, but and hold those lines. But you, you're allowed to hold those lines in jovial ways, in through connection. Like, yeah. bro, come on. You know, I can't do that with you. Like, that was funny though. Nice try. Or like, you know, we can have like actual human dialogues with folks that we're working with that straddle these lines right that but again are rooted in connection and are respected these are necessary i think conversations to have about again how, how the work is understood mm -hmm. yeah. it totally yeah and the boundary need not be like an electric fence that's gonna zap someone yeah, right? yeah. Like, 
<laughs> they touch it. Yeah. yeah. I love also the way that you're talking about like just being your authentic self and like being humorous and like uh, joking around, like using the language that the kids are using already. Right. Yeah. In a way that's not. Yeah. 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 I mean, we could go on forever about language. How do you use language in a way that's not like appropriating the language, right? And like, I had to learn about Big Bro, Little Bro to use it, right? In fact, mm -hmm. there's an argument to be made that if a young person is calling you Big Bro, that it invites you to use Little Bro, but that you can't just use it if it's not already been, you know, that yeah. is the open, right? I Offer. couldn't just walk up to a kid and say Little Bro, right, without... So again, like when you're in it, when you're in the space, when you're when you're listening, when youth are, and it comes back to what we we're saying to start this, like when youth are allowed to tell you their stories in their own words and not in defined ways where expression is not defined by anybody but the person that is expressing the narrative, then you learn and you hear and then you can reflect back and utilize all of your micro skills in whatever way you do using that language, working with them through that language, um, because you've heard it, because you've learned it, right? And and that's, it's the appreciation versus appropriation, I suppose. Yeah, what I hope we can do more of in our, in our work collectively. Yeah, well, I mean, that leads me to want to ask you, I mean, especially as someone who educates counselor educators, right, in, a, in addition to the work that you do in schools, and in your research and all the rest of it, I wonder, is there something that you would like to communicate to like the next generations of counselors or other like community builders who are doing this work, like how they can sort of be in this expansive liberatory spirit that you're talking about? And also, I guess part of that is like, how do you think that this should um, enter into the academy as we're as we're teaching new um, mental health workers? Yeah. Well, I'll, I, I'll start with the latter question. So for me, right, like I'm just finishing up or actually I just did last week, finish up my second go around of my uh, hip hop and spoken word therapy and school counseling practice class. So I taught a hip hop class for master students since an elective within the department. And it's a very like immersive experiential class where Folks are writing their own songs, creating their own like visual representations of those songs. Um, we had like five guest lectures this term. I had a DJ come through. I had this graphic artist like collective that does a lot of like hip hop inspired design work come Sick. in. I had freestyle artists and other artists like I just like trying to create culture within the classroom create instances of hip hop culture that students could like sit in and experience within the academy um, by partnering with folks on the outside. And one of the privileges of being kind of in a little bit of an administrator role within my department is like finding some honorariums to, to it's not much, but pay folks a couple hundred dollars to come through and present on their work, you know, compensating folks in the community for coming and sharing the gifts that they have with students. I think all of that's necessary. Creating, again, like these kind of group and individual counseling skills coursework that are creative and it doesn't have to be hip hop, but I think arts-based approaches are really unique and cool uh, to consider. And so for me, that's like this multimodal hip hop course it was one way that I think we can get some of this work uh, into the academy. And I've been looking at the impact that that has on folks development um, as counselors. And so thinking about development as counselors, I think identity development as practitioners, how do we authentically bring ourselves to the work, right? Coming back to these humanistic principles, right? Like the best way to authentically invite people that we're working with to present themselves authentically in session is to be authentic ourselves. Like if I'm not real, like there's a 0% chance that the person is going to want to be real with me. If they can sense that I'm fake or uncomfortable, they're not going to open up, right? Like we know these things, right? And so there's realness is reciprocal, right? Like if I'm going to be real, then somebody's going to be real in return, vice versa. So that then is a huge ask of, of clinicians. Like we have to enter the work authentically. 
I think that that means figuring out what skills and interests you have and how you bring that to light in your work. I brought a microphone in my office because I love hip hop, right? And you might not love hip hop and that's okay, but you love something. I have grad students that are like photographers and stuff. Why aren't you trying to run a group that utilizes photography or looking at like the, there's really cool, like participatory action research that looks at like photo voice and photo elicitation. There's folks that do like wilderness based counseling stuff that love like hiking. Do, like, how do you bring who you are to the work? Right. And I think our professional identity development as counseling professionals has to be tethered to things that are authentic about us. Right. And like, and using that to elevate the practical work that we do. And I think by doing that, we, we present ourselves more authentically to the folks we're working with and invite them to do the same. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. Yeah. It really is like a call, right. To people who are entering this profession, like look within yourself and bring it, bring it with love as a true offering. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I really want to thank you, Dr. Levy. Thank you so much for taking the time, for sharing of your perspectives, of your heart, of your work. I know I'll be chewing on it for some time. And <laughs> well, no, no, no problem. And thank you for, for the invitation. All right. Um, Take good care. Be well. Yes, Thanks you again. too. Bye-bye. Bye. This podcast was edited by Charlie Spears. Theme music by Bang Quang. Special thanks to Dr. James Norris and Dr. Erica Lillette for their mentorship and enthusiastic support with this project. I'm your ever-curious host, Ava Bravada-Keating. Thank you for listening. Bye.